have with me Greg Hill from Our, Our Children Have Rights Too uh, down in Florida. I, I connected with Greg and also Jake Hornstein, uh, who is his partner, so to speak, in this endeavor. Uh, these two guys are doing incredible work down in Florida. Uh, and uh, Greg's got a really good story to tell. So he asked, they asked if we could talk to him about that and, and get the word out. Uh, so that's what we're here to do uh, here today. So, hey, Greg, how are you doing? Oh, all is well, good, sir. All is well. I can't complain. I mean, even if I did, you know, no one's going to listen anyway. So, you know, full speed ahead. <laughs> uh, our Children Have Rights, your organization, uh, talking to you guys and how that came about. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess a good portion of that comes from your own personal experience uh, as a father. Um, so, uh, I guess uh, maybe share a little bit about how all of this got started for you. Yeah. So the origination of our children have rights really did uh, derive from my story. Right. Uh, so originally my son was, con was conceived in the state of New Jersey and three weeks before he was born, mom stated that I couldn't support him. So she moved to Florida. So, of course, I moved to Florida to, you know, come down and protect his rights to have access to me. And so in the process of doing that, you know, I was able to uh, do it the wrong way and the right way. So originally, uh, I went and did what everybody else would do, and I got myself a lawyer. And, you know, it's always a misconception that, hey, the lawyer is going to take care of everything for you. It's going to be fine. The lawyer is going to work it out. All right. But originally, you know, my lawyer basically uh, didn't do, do the best job of representing me, in my opinion. And so I came out of mediation ordered to pay $1,141 a month for a son that couldn't see me. And so, of course, you know, I came back here to this very office feeling as if I failed the young man as a father, you know, feeling down about myself. And so I began to uh, drink really heavily and I drank probably about a bottle of liquor a day during that time for the, for about three months. And then uh, the light bulb just went off and uh, I said, well, you know what, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to approach this thing, I'm going to do it my way. So I got rid of everybody else who had anything to say about the actual process. And I began to read and research and learn anything that I could use when it came to custody uh, child support, or anything that I could learn, you know, when it came to the accountability for the children. So with that information, then I was able to get back into court and represent myself. And so remember, I was paying eleven forty one a month originally. So once I got into the courtroom, I was able to represent myself and show the judge where some of the actual judgments was off. I was able to get it turned around, and so now I pay one hundred and twenty four dollars a month. And my son has 50-50 access to me. So now, you know, feeling as if I've won, now, you know, I've gotten over the hurdle. My son has access to me. I'm paying a more reasonable payment when it comes to child support. I, I, I feel as if I have a, I've won, I have a victory. But then there, there has to be something more to do. That there, there, there has to be more people going through this process. And so when I began to write the process down that I used, to protect my son's right to have access to me. And that formed the book, Our Children Have Rights. It's out on Amazon right now. All you gotta do is type in and research Our, Our Children Have Rights and you can go in and find the book. And I really wanted that book to be a guide and a blueprint to some of the, some of the things that we could use to protect our children's rights to have access to us. And so now being armed with the book, I began to go to different podcasts, different speaking engagements. Um, I spoke in for an uh, organization in Australia, um, the UK, uh, Italy, um, Brazil, Canada. So, you know, I just began to spread the word and people love the information. And so, you know, by trade, I'm, uh, I, I did IT security, but I was still doing my IT security. And, uh, you know, I went to uh, my business partner's house one day to help him with some of his IT work. And I had on a shirt stating our children have rights. And he began to ask me, you know, hey, what does this mean? You know, what, what is going on? What, you know, are you, he really thought I was in a band. He said, you know, what, what, what is this? What, what are you, what, are, what is the shirt that you have on? <laughs> so I began to tell him the story of the work that I'd done to protect my son's right to have access to me. 
And then we put our heads together and said, hey, this could be a nonprofit organization. He asked me, you know, did I know anything about it? I said, no. He said he knows, you know, a good deal about nonprofit organizations. And so then we launched our children have rights.org, the nonprofit organization. And that was really the beginning of us working together to get this actual organization off the ground and help all the children and families that we've helped to this day. That's pretty extraordinary. Um, that, that is a couple of comments. First off, at the very outset, um, uh, it struck me that you had mentioned you were in New Jersey with mm -hmm. mom, correct? Right. And mom, after you guys had separated, uh, went to Florida. Yes, moved to Florida. Did you, had you ever been to Florida before or, you know, like, did you know people in Florida or? So originally my family is from Florida and her family's from Florida also. So she, she stated that, you know, she wanted to come down for support, but never gave me a chance to support the child. So. So you, and you had your life there in New Jersey, right? Right. Uh, we were both making great money. You know, we both had you know really solid jobs. We were both homeowners. Um, and the idea and the objective behind, you know, owning the house was to make sure that, you know, my son had uh, some access to the funds. So I was renting out the top unit and I was going to use that unit to support our son. Absolutely. Uh, I guess one of the other things, too, is and, and to go back to this point about the attorneys. Um, one of the things that I've observed uh, in life in general, like anything mm -hmm. that you do, whether it's a teacher, whether it's someone in the trades, whether it's someone in business, you have the A team, the B team, the C team, the D team, the E team, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The people who are really good, the people who are good, average, below average, and people who really shouldn't be doing it at all, right? Correct. And it's the same thing with attorneys. Uh, and uh, I just had this conversation uh, less than an hour ago, talking to a father on the phone for, for uh, not the first time. Mm -hmm. Many fathers are like, I've never had involvement with courts or attorneys or judges ever before until this. Right. And so they don't know what to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And you just think all attorneys are just going to do, you know, a okay job at least. And that's really not the case. Correct. Uh, and even more so in family law than business law or things like that because it's just a different scenario whatsoever. And so it's really unfortunate. Uh, a lot of people pay a lot of money mm -hmm. and you hear, you got to have a lawyer. You got to have a lawyer. It's what, what you're supposed to do. And right. I used to say like going to a uh, court without an attorney is like going to a knife fight with a plastic spork, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta have an attorney. And, and the more I see it, the more that's dubious. Like mm -hmm. if you get a good attorney who really knows what they're doing and they're committed to working for you, yeah, that's better. Mm -hmm. That really is not the case most often times, unfortunately, by my observations. Correct. And uh, I also agree with that. Uh, it's really less about the attorney and more about the parent, right? So what I've found is, you know, once parents educate themselves on the process and how this actually works, they can have better outcomes because then you can hold the attorney and everyone else involved accountable. But if you're if you're oblivious to what's really supposed to be going on, then you have no idea what's supposed to happen and you leave it in the hands of someone else. So it really depends more on the parents and not the attorney, right? Because you have to understand what's going on. So that way, if the attorney missteps or if the attorney is doing something that you know you may not agree with, well, you understand how the process works. You could talk to the attorney and get the attorney back on track. No, I wanted this to happen. Or, you know, this is what the law states in this area. Or this is what, you know, the documentation says. It's here right here in black and white. So, you know, you might be, the attorney may be doing something that, you know, maybe, maybe going to hurt your case. But, you know, if you actually understand how the process works, you can hold everybody accountable. And I'm pretty sure you can have a better, a more favorable outcome for your children. So I agree with you. I'm, I'm not as good at communicating that as what you are, but I say they work for you. Right. So you tell them what to do. Don't That's always true. just go along with the flow. Because I've seen, and it, it, this is a really repeated pattern with PFAs in particular, where mm -hmm. They hold people off until right five minutes before the hearing. The judge shuffles the lawyers out. They talk 
And then they nope. come to the dad and say, well, you never know what you do when you go into a PFA hearing. You need to agree to what they're agreeing to. And part of what you need to agree to is you're not seeing your kids. Right? Exactly. Exactly. That's the kind of shady stuff that happens consistently. That's right. And, and if you don't know what you're looking at with, with the documentation, you have no idea what's going on. Case in point, right? Uh, in my case, Mom stated that, you know, she was paying $1,600 a month in child care. Uh, she was paying $800 a month in insurance. Uh, you know, I had zero overnights. And that was that was so far from the truth. You know, my son wasn't in, he wasn't in daycare. And and we asked, you know, well, who's your nanny? Who's the, who's the daycare? She said, well, he has an in-home nanny. This is the judge asking her. You know, she has an in-home, he has an in-home nanny. The judge says, okay, well, does the nanny have a, have an EIN number? Is this a, is this a business? You know what, what's going on? And she says, no, his nanny is my mom. Just says, oh no, you can't count that. <laughs> you can't count that. See, but if you don't know, if you're uneducated on the process, you don't know what to look for. So you're saying when you had an attorney, the attorney let all that go. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And see, me not knowing the process, right, not knowing that, you know, the overnights are a direct correlation to your support obligation, not knowing the insurance is a direct correlation to the support obligation. You know, all these things that are added into the documentation, I have no idea how this works. But then once I educate myself, I'm like, wait a minute, this is what the state says is how it's supposed to be calculated. This is the actual child support calculator that they're using to come up with the number. Here are the inputs that are supposed to be in there. And these inputs are skewed that they have in here. So that's what's raising the number up crazy high. And so once I understand what, what they're using, what the formula is, I can go back and check the formula. It's just like Y equals MX plus B. Once you know the formula, you never lose it. it it's there. But if we don't know what to look for, we don't know the formula, then, you know, they could tell us anything. We just go with it because we didn't know. And a lot of men see. So like you have a very analytical mind, mm -hmm. uh, you know, most people don't. But a lot of men who are going through this, they're overwhelmed. Correct. And particularly with the domestic relations, child support end of it, like it's it's good. It's challenging for them to be mm -hmm. able to weed through all those various factors. I mean, I talked to a lot of fathers that like, I know this math doesn't work, you know, to, mm -hmm. but they, it's hard for them to be able to go through and unpack all of that. Um, and I also have seen sometimes they, if they're not held to account in some way, some of the people who do this, let those things slide. They do. They so, do. so, But this is also why it is imperative that we as parents, we go and do our research. We get in front of this. We we be proactive instead of reactive. Even if you know something is wrong, okay, go and find yourself some resources so you can figure out, you know, where is it wrong and why is it wrong so you can get it corrected. But if you just let it go, then anything could happen to you. So it is imperative that, you know, you get in front of this. You go and protect this child, these children's rights to have access to you. And that's one of the things that our Children Have Rights does. We want to be proactive instead of reactive. We want to get in front of your case. So this way, by the time it gets to the court, you already have the thing that you need in place to go ahead and state your claim and make sure that the judge understands you are an accountable parent. This has nothing to do with the other party, nothing to do with anyone else. It, it, is, it is everybody here being accountable, and we want to do what is in the best interest of these children. That is what we're trying to do here at Our Children Have Rights. All right. All right. So we, we can loop back to that. So what resources when you are educating yourself and preparing mm -hmm. yourself? Now, Florida is a little different from Pennsylvania and all mm -hmm. the states are different if someone's in Illinois or mm -hmm. California or something like that. So it's a little different down there than it is up here in Pennsylvania. Right. What resources and, and how did you go about educating yourself to get all this kind of information? Mm -hmm. It was a lot of looking at, you know, the child support uh, website. A um, lot of uh, looking at, you know, different reading materials that were already out in front of us. You know, I went and I did a lot of Google searching. I did a lot of looking at videos on YouTube on how to, you know, defend yourself or how to, you know, what, what is child support? You know, what are the calculations? How are they coming up with these numbers? Uh, what is it that, you know, what, what are the actual, you know, um, parenting plans that are out there? 
right? So you know, it was just a lot of digging and a lot of researching on a lot of different topics. And so as I researched, you know, I was writing these things down so I could use them for my case. But, you know, you have to, you have to be proactive instead of reactive to go out and find this information. And luckily now for people, you know, OCHR has already put these things together for you. So you don't have to go and do all the blind searching like I did. You know, you can literally go to our website, type in a topic, and you can get a lot of the information that you're looking for. Right. Even if it's not in your state, you get some idea of where to look or what to look for. So you can find it in another state and you go back into your state and look for something similar or that same you know, idea of what you're looking for. But it is imperative that the research is done before, you know, you get into that courtroom, before you start the process of protecting the child rights to have access to you. So there's there's many ways to go and view it. Even on the back of the book that I wrote, I put links in the back of the book for several states to just go and find some of the information that you're looking for. And then once you start looking in the right direction, you can pretty much almost find any and everything that you're looking for. But you have to be able to, you know, go start and then understand where to look for some of that information. So a lot of websites on the different, definitely the uh, child support websites for each state. Um, I will look there. Um, I will start looking at, you know, some of the documents and some of the things that they have at the courthouse. You know, you can go and look at some of the motions because every courthouse is going to have some PDFs of some of the motions and it'll and it'll show you how, you know, how did some of these motions are supposed to work. So it just depends on, you know, how diligent that the parents want to be. But the information is definitely out there. And I would say start with the child support um, website from your state. Start there. Yeah, so up here and we discussed this, uh, they're bifurcated in Pennsylvania. It doesn't mm -hmm. it isn't in the same uh, uh, in front of the same judge or anything. Matter of fact, you don't go in front of a judge for child support in Pennsylvania. There's a there's a county office you go to. You only mm -hmm. end up in a judge if you're appealing what the county office finds out. Uh, we, we've been talking about parenting plans. Uh, and even if your state doesn't utilize parenting plans or your county doesn't utilize parenting plans, it might be useful or helpful as you're going into it if you can develop a good solid, detailed parenting plan. And that's something that you're big on and that you help people with, you coach people through with down there. So maybe you can share some information on um, what it takes or, or templates or something to be able to do parenting plans. So first thing we want to do is understand what the parenting plan is. This is going to be an ironclad contract that the two parents negotiate, you know, to make sure they establish what is in the best interest of their child. You know, who's going to cover what? You know, what's going to happen when the child turns what age? Uh, who's going to support in what way? You know, that that's an actual contract between the parents that spells out everything that needs to go in and happen for the children. You know, how you're going to communicate. You know, it may have something about, you know, uh, a communication application inside the actual parenting plan. But this is going to be the document that is agreed to by everyone that the courts can actually use to hold everyone accountable with. Right. And so you really want to have that ironclad parenting plan. So just in case, you know, one parent changed their mind or they want to do something different, you have that document that both parents signed off on that says, wait a minute, no, we discussed this and we said we're going to do this. And so if you don't follow this plan, now we can go back to a judge and a judge can hold us both accountable according to what we agreed to in this plan. So you really want to have that parenting plan. So you have a ground and a stasis to negotiate from. So that, that's what the parenting plan is going to be. And so the, some of the ways that you can find or look at some templates for your parenting plan, you can go, one of the ones, one of my favorites is, uh, I think it's like an exchange, exchange, uh, it's, a, it's a website. Hold on one second. Let me see. It's, it's a custody um, exchange. Custody exchange. Yes, that's it. You can go to custody exchange and go and look at some templates for your parenting plans to get you a good start. And then from there, you know, you can break down, you know, whatever you want for the child, and then you can negotiate that with the other parent. That's really what, you know, how you're supposed to do it through mediation, right? You know, if both parents come in with what they think should happen for in the best interest of the child, and then, you know, you can go in and negotiate halfway or in the middle of, you know, what can be done. And then by the end of mediation, you know, we come to an agreement of what should happen with the child. We can both sign it. And then we're both good to go. We have something to hold each other accountable with. That's one of the best things and the best ways of having what's in the best interest of the child written down. So, you know, we, we can hold each other accountable with that actual document. 
right? So that it's, it's, it's a good tool for parents, especially high conflict parents. Um, it's a great tool to have a guideline or something that you can go by, you know, something you can point back to and say, hey, on this date and at this time, we said we were going to do this for our child. And you decided to do something else. Well, now I have some grounds to hold you accountable. And it's in document. It's, it's, it's in black and white. Right. So instead of instead of, you know, people just going by whatever they think at that time, we have something that's written down. And so that's really, you know, the importance of a parenting plan. It's a way to hold both parents accountable. And if you're not accountable, you can get back to the authority figure in your state and your county and they can help with the accountability using that document. So that's really the importance of the parenting plan, which is why I'm big on the parenting plan, because parents may change their mind in the middle of, you know, in the middle of the week or no matter what's going on, a parent, a parent could change it up. And, and if there's no document that says, hey, this is what you said or this is what we agreed to, then the parents can just do whatever and there's nothing to hold them accountable. That's why it is imperative that we have parenting plans for that accountability in the best interest of the child. You know, what I see a lot of the times is just things that are talked about in the court and the judge says, I want this, I want this, I want this. And so you have a court order with like this mishmash of mm -hmm. things in it that don't, doesn't cover everything. Right. right. And so I think that that's a better approach to doing it and just lay everything out in mm -hmm. detail. If you're, if that's your dynamic, if you're really not mm -hmm. getting along, right. If you're constantly having problems, if, if it's contentious, Mm -hmm. Most people are working out on their own, but if not, the more information you have there, the more detail, black and white, like this is what the holidays are. This is the right. times, you know, right. and, so, and, that, and that, you know, remo removes a lot of the ambiguity in, in the actual decision making because it's already written down. We've already agreed to. So if we have this agreement, well, you don't have to ask me anything. You can just go and look at the documentation. And we both know what's supposed to happen because we both have the same document. But if you don't have a lot of these things written down, well, now, you know, one parent could interpret something another way. And now we're both not getting along. And now you have a high conflict situation because we did not know it was not written down. We don't have an agreement on what should happen in a situation like this. So it is definitely important to have as much detail as possible because the judge is going to just do a blanket, you know, parenting plan. And it's going to have a lot of ambiguity in it because, you know, it's not going to be as detailed as it should be. But if parents can come together and write down the details of some things that they have concerns about and come to a point where you, you negotiate it, then, you know, you can have a better outcome for the child. And that, and that lessens the ambiguity, lessens the conflict that could happen between two parents. So the parenting plan is a powerful tool. It's very important to have it. It's, it's very, it's very uh, so, um, you know, substantial to, you know, what's going on in your case. And it keeps you both out of, pro out of problems and it keeps everybody accountable. So it's, it's a great tool. All right, all right. So can you talk a little bit more about Our Children Have Rights, the organization, uh, let mm -hmm. people know more about it? Mm -hmm. So OCHR, again, you know, was derived from our story. And uh, again, we want to be proactive instead of reactive. And we do that by using what we call our program pillars, right? We use our three pillars. Education is the first one. You know, parents come to us and they have no idea where to start this program and this process. So the first thing that we want to do is educate them on the process of protecting their children's right to have access to them. You know, what is a parenting plan? What is a VDOP or an AOP? You know, the acknowledgement of paternity or the voluntary declaration of paternity or whatever it's called in your state. You know, do you have that? Um, did you establish paternity? Right. You know, and then we educate parents on these things. And so by the time you're ready to go through this process, you're educated on how the process works. And that's the first thing that we want to do for our parents is educate them. No matter where you are in the process, we want to we want to troubleshoot your process and then educate you so you're you're in the right place, right? And so that's the first pillar is the education. The second pillar is mental health. So one of the best things about OCHR is yes, we have you know mental health uh, resources. We're not mental health providers. We do have people that we can point you in the direction of to get the mental health services that you need. But at the same time, we're also a program that has a father who's done it the wrong way and the right way. So we get the opportunity to tell you from the parent's point of view how to handle some of these things, right? And so with, along with the education, you know, we, we have that one-on-one -on -one with the parents and we, we get the opportunity to share that empathy. 
And we get to do what I call, you know, talking these parents off of the ledge, right? The first thing parents want to do is they want to go right into fight or flight because they know it's wrong, but they're just not educated. They don't know how, why it's wrong. And so they're fighting, but they don't know why or how to fight. And so we want to make sure that, you know, as we educate them and make sure their minds are right, that they're not fighting and they're actually moving in the right direction. And so that's part of our mental health service, mental health and wellness, right? And then the third part is the legal aid and documentation review. Okay, now that you're educated and your mind is right, you know, you're thinking about this correctly. Now, what does your documentation say? Do, did you have the VDOP? If you didn't sign that, well, then let's get that. Let's make sure that you can get that signed. If you're outside of the, the, the statute of limitation to sign the VDOP, okay, well, do you have a parenting plan? If you don't have one, then let's work on getting you a parenting plan. Did you establish that paternity? If you didn't, let's figure out how to get paternity established for you. Let's make sure your documentation is in the right place. So this way, when it's time to go and protect that child's right to have access to you, you're educated, your mind is right, and your documentation is in the right place. So now you're ready to go through mediation. And, you know, we can help coach you through mediation. We want you to go in with written out a written out ironclad mediated, you know, an agreement that you both can can agree to. And if it's something that you need to negotiate, you know, we can help coach you through the negotiation period of it. Right. And so now you're educated. Your mind is right. Your documentation. Right. You know, you've gone through mediation. Let's say mediation didn't work for you and you want to get representation for yourself. Well, what we want to do is make sure you you have that that the, the best lawyer or the reputable lawyer that you can get. And so we work with the bar associations. You know, you know that, you know, these are good and reputable lawyers because they're with the bar. They've passed the bar. They've done all the prerequisites to represent you. So you're educated, your mind is right, your documentation is right, and you have representation that is good enough for you to go into a courtroom and protect the child's right to have access to you. That's what we're trying to do here at Our Children Have Rights. We want to make sure that you have everything that you need to go in and have a more favorable outcome than you would have had if you'd gone in without any of these services. That's Our Children Have Rights. Wow, that, that's pretty impressive, making something that is extraordinarily messy, mm -hmm. complicated into something that might be um, a little more organized, sensible, right. uh, and working towards something that can be more productive ultimately for the children. Because the more this stuff drags out, the more mm -hmm. there's uncertainty, the more there's more acrimony, the time yep. goes on and there's back and forth. Who suffers from all of that? Yep, the children. The children suffer from that when when they're they're going through this long process of you know what mom and dad going back and forth. The children are the ones who suffer. So it is it is our it is, it is one of the main things that we want to do is make sure that you know we alleviate that suffering for the children from the children and make sure that this process can go as smooth as possible and we can get our focus back where it needs to be and that's on the children. Which is why you hear in our title, our children have rights. This is not about mom or dad, or grandparents, or uncle, or anybody else. This is about the children, and our children have those rights. That's what it's all about, dude. And I Absolutely. think people lose sight of that far too often. They focus on mom and dad not getting along, and that drama, and right. the kids just get lost when, when all of that's going on. Absolutely. And, you know, the statistics show this, right? Uh, we have stats that show, you know, children who, you know, the children who don't have access to both parents, um, they're more likely to have uh, reading issues. They're more likely to have behavioral issues. They're more likely to try drugs. They're more likely to go into the detention center. They're more likely to have behavioral issues, less likely to graduate high school, less likely to go to college, less likely to have a better paying job. So all of this is riding on parents being able to get together and be the best that they can be for the children. You know, and, and, if, and if your child does not have this, you're really setting your child back. You know, you're hurting your child. You're doing a disservice to your child when that child doesn't have access to both parents. And we can go even further. Women who have 50-50, you know, who share 50-50 with the actual father, um, these, these mothers make more money. They, they, they have more time to go into the workforce and do better for themselves. They are higher educated. Um, they have better mental health. You know, they have better physical health. So it just makes sense for, you know, moms 
to say, hey, no, you helped create this child. So I want you to help be accountable for this child. And then it goes back to dad also. Dads who have the access to the children are less likely to have mental health issues. They, they're a lower suicide rate. They're, they're better financially. They're better physically. So it's just, a, it's just a main thing. It's just a better situation for the family when these two parents get along and share that access to the children, it benefits everybody involved. This is more of a holistic approach for the family. It helps the family when the children's rights are being protected by both parties. <laughs> you very well said on all accounts. And there's a couple of different avenues there. I always say the best thing you can do for mothers is support fatherhood. That's right. <laughs> Parenting is a two person job. Right. Right. It's a two person job, man. And even if you break it down, there's 24 hours in a day. If right. there's something for eight hours, that's two eight hour shifts, right? Right. Um, right. But kids need both parents, as you said so very well, to give because parents give different but equally important things to their children. That's right. And if a child is denied what either a mother or a father can give to them, they're not having a complete childhood and they're going to be right. less likely to be successful and happy as adults. Right. Absolutely. You know, so it's really important in these situations when you have a separated family that you button things up mm -hmm. right? and you get on top of things because that puts them at a disadvantage as is. It's just a matter of trying to do your best under the less than ideal circumstances. Absolutely right. And that's it in a nutshell right there. You know, you really want what's in, everybody wants what's in the best interest of the children when it comes down to it. So let's just figure out, you know, how do we get this done? You know, let's handle business. Let's 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 be adults and let's not, you know, go back and bicker and act like children and fight back and forth because of our feelings are hurt because this has nothing to do about our feelings. This has everything to do about these children. Let's protect these children's rights to have access to both of us. And then let's be a better family. Let's be a better situation for our children. That's it. All right. Well, that's that's perfect right there. Um, so uh, one last time with mm -hmm. our children have rights. Uh, how, how can people look it up? Uh, you know, where can they get more information about it? So our children have rights is a virtual organization. Anybody that has internet, you can go and find us at OCHR.org or ourchildrenhaverights.org. You can go there. You can find a wealth of information. And if you need to reach out to us and get a little more explanation about this information, there's a contact us link there. All you have to do is fill out the questionnaire and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Again, you can reach, reach us at OCHR.org or our children have rights.org. Reach out to us. We are happy to help no matter where you are in the world, in the country, in the state. Reach out. We are here to help. All right. My man, Greg. Uh, incredible work with you and Jake. Uh, I've met a lot of fantastic people along the way in a lot of different states doing a lot of good work for families, for children, mm -hmm. for fathers. Uh, you guys, um, you, you're just, you got it buttoned up down there. And um, I'm, I'm so impressed uh, by you guys and I'm proud to call you guys colleagues in this, this effort and this work that we're doing. Absolutely. You as well. You know, we definitely appreciate the work that you were doing and keep doing what you do. You know, one of these days, you know, we're really going to put a dent in this thing and make a difference for these children in this country, in your state, you know, in your county, you know, no matter where you are, you know, we're going to get this done and we keep working at it. So keep doing what you're doing and, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that we do a collaborative effort to make sure that we are protecting these children's right to have access to both parents equally. All right, Greg. All right. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.